Well, hi, everyone, and welcome back to Crosswires. It's James here. As always, we're looking at things in technology that maybe are things that don't often get talked about or cool things in technology. And this week, you know, we, we've talked about storytelling through through video, through music, and through graphic design and games. But this week, I thought we'd take it back and look at the written word. And my guest this week is is a perfect guest to talk about this because we've got a wonderful blend of tech and writing. So would you all please welcome Matt Gemmell. How you doing, Matt? Hi there. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm amazed that I've got all this set up working. I was saying to Matt pre-show that this is, again, podcasting from a Steam Deck, this time with a little bit uh, better lighting, a uh, little bit little bit better audio, and not quite as rushed a setup. I'm using a 32-inch a TV as a monitor, and it's... It's kind of working, you know. If I'll say one thing, I am mind blown by how much you can do on that little Steam Deck. It's quite, it's quite a gadget, isn't it? I've got a few friends who've got one. Uh, I don't have one myself, but uh, no, it's uh, astonishing what you can make it do. I guess this is uh, good practice for you when you need to cobble together a podcasting setup after the coming apocalypse. Indeed, yes, absolutely. Uh, but the interesting thing is, just as a random aside, we're going to be trying Twitch streaming from this device as well. And in theory, it should possibly outperform my 2017 iMac. That's pretty amazing. In theory, is uh, is one of these phrases though that that must be borne out by, ex- by experience. But uh, yeah, it's, it's incredible what you can do with compact kit these days. Oh gosh, I mean, just oh, just look at the iPad. But before we get into some of our actual discussion, Matt, would you like to tell people a little bit about yourself? Because I know there's there's plenty of opportunities for promotion here. So have at it. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, my name is Matt Gemmel and I am Scottish in case that hasn't come across already. My background back in the midst of time was as a software engineer, a consultant software engineer, worked for a bunch of companies including Apple and then about 10 years ago I decided to have a go at writing before I got any older. So I'm a novelist and have been for quite a while and that's a wonderful thing to be because when people and out in the real world ask what you do for a living and you say I'm a novelist the answer is invariably you're the first one of those I've ever actually met in person so I've got a few books out uh, another one just on the cusp of being finished Uh, I also have a podcast about writing because there's nothing writers love more uh, than talking about writing instead of actually doing the writing Uh, and I also publish a weekly tiny little short story of sort of thousand words or so that goes out for free in all kinds of genres fantastic yeah and we will of course make sure we put links to all of matt's books into the show notes it's really interesting because i i love reading i i'll be honest you know with my eyesight as many of you know i struggle I mean, just it's my cassette i struggle with traditional paper books so digital books like the, you know things like the kindle and you know even just apple's ibooks make such a, such a substantial difference but from a writing point of view matt i what tools do you find are invaluable i mean uh, do you want to tell bit talk a little bit about your your setup for the actual writing of the books because i might uh, now i might be wrong I, i'm going to assume you might have changed setups but at one point you were doing everything on your ipad in fact, I'm completely uh, an iPad only uh, since uh, I started talking about that, uh, which is the the time that you're recalling. Uh, I've used the iPad absolutely full time. So I do the entire spectrum from working up ideas and planning, writing the first draft, editing and even publishing uh, completely from the iPad now, which is fantastic. My main tool for writing is an app called Ulysses, which is a... Uh, Plain text, as in Markdown uh, app, you you write in. If your if your readers aren't familiar with Markdown, I, sorry, your your listeners, I imagine many of them are. But it's a plain text format that can be sort of compiled into rich text. And Ulysses is very much aimed at people who are writing long form text, including fiction. So it's got a number of conveniences for that. And it can export not just uh, some ebook formats like EPUB, which is the ubiquitous one, but also uh, press ready, print ready PDF masters for to turn into paperbacks. So I'm thankfully now with some of the 
uh, publisher websites having been updated to more modern technologies and workflows in the last few years, I can do literally the entire process from start to finish completely on an iPad. Wow. And I'm a big fan of Ulysses. I use Ulysses a lot combined with our next cloud instance to uh, write up some of the show notes. I don't, I, I don't know if you noticed, but when I sent over the show notes, that is just a markdown file that, uh, that next cloud is rendering for us in a handy little collaborative editor. Yeah. I saw the, the sort of markup buttons and it's, it's usually something that's got marked down behind it these days. Uh, it's just such a, wonderful format and there are uh, interpreters, compilers, whatever the correct term is, uh, to turn it into HTML or other rich formats on practically every platform and using every programming language so it's incredibly portable and of course it keeps your valuable work in a plain format that you can take with you for the rest of your life. Because you're not, you're not having to rely on, oh, has my, I mean, let's be very honest, has Microsoft introduced a bug into Word that's going to completely break my writing workflow? If, for example, some, if, for example, something changed in Ulysses, you're like, oh, I don't like the direction we're heading. I mean, I'm a big Ulysses fan as well, as I said, but if that changed, then you just take your markdown files to the next app. You've not lost anything everything's still there and no there's no formatting changes anything like that it's all just that same markdown now am i right markdown was a john gruber sort of thing originally yes john gruber uh created markdown he wrote the original uh script that transforms it into html in the the Perl language, as I recall. Oh, wow. And it's caught on. There are various derivatives of it. GitHub's got their own flavor of it that uh, people can use for documents associated with source code projects. Um, and there are lots of extensions to Markdown that provide additional features that the original spec didn't. Uh, and these days, you know, if you use any web CMS of any kind, it's pretty much going to support Markdown, as do all the static web blogging uh, software tools so as you say uh, if you've got something in markdown you know that not only is it a plain text format that you can take wherever but that it'll be understood and interpreted and rendered just about everywhere you go as well and that's really good i mean again be able to export out to pdf and press not just pdf but press ready pdf from universe universal uh, from ulysses is fantastic i guess one, one question that i was going to ask you about because obviously with an ipad if you don't mind me asking which ipad are you currently sort of rocking for your for your writing work my current ipad uh, I've, I've had the, the 12.9 inch ipad pros for a few generations it's not that absolutely latest one which i think was the last year's yeah. 2022 with the apple pencil hover thing it's the previous one which is the first one that had the, the mini led display and the hdr support so it's that one that i've got at the moment brilliant and are you finding that that's up for 12.9 inch because that's comparable to say very comparable to one of the original map well not the original to, to a macbook air almost the screen size do you find that that's big enough for you to work on Yes, because of iOS or rather iPadOS now, since they've they obviously branched uh, a few years ago, because there is very much that focus, at least historically, although it's starting to change on having one app or two apps at the most having your attention at a time, I find that being in that sort of mindset anyway makes the comparatively limited screen size not a, a problem, but actually rather an asset when you're writing, you're not typically looking at multiple apps at the same time. You're either sitting, planning something, mind mapping, brainstorming, or you're doing an outline, or you're sitting for hours and days and weeks and months writing away, and it becomes counterproductive to lots of other windows floating about. So even when I was back on Max full time, I was typically just putting apps into full screen Anyway, and indeed all of the writing apps, uh, Ulysses itself, Scrivener is another very popular one. They all have these no distraction, full screen, just get absorbed in the text kind of modes. And iPadOS has always been about that since it sort of was a derivative of iOS to start with. So no, the screen size is absolutely fine for me. The reason I went for the bigger one rather than the 11 inch series of iPad Pros was just because... When I'm not writing, when I'm doing planning things uh, for books, I, I like to use it as a, a drawing pad sort of thing with notebook apps like GoodNotes and even mind mapping like MindNode 
and it's just helpful to have a wee bit of extra room when I'm doing that kind of work. And I, and I guess because I you know I remember when my iPad originally launched and people were saying this you can't do any real work on an iPad you can't but I think that's maybe unfair because it depends on the type of work you're doing if you are someone who wants to focus on a single task or a single thing so for example I edit as many of you know I edit all of the audio for this podcast on the iPad using Ferrite. And we actually have an interview with Canis, who's the lead developer of Ferrite soon. But I find it... Inc- That's fantastic. Tell him tell him I'm a big fan of Ferrite, because I use that for editing my podcast as well. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah, isn't it just magical? Mm. Apple Pencil to scrub audio? I mean, oh, it's... it's sorry. I, I get... Every time I find another Ferrite fan, I get rather excited. I will... Well, we... No, it's wonderful. The ripple delete with the pencil when you're uh, drawing from right to left is absolutely fantastic. It was Jason Snell that switched me onto it, and it's a wonderful app. It is. I know uh, Stephen Robles from the HomeKit and Apple Insider podcast is a big Ferrite user. But, again, it just goes to show the iPad is an incredibly powerful tool. In terms of the actual because you mentioned then about you know uh, planning for stories because i mean i have never written a novel i've written blog posts i've written bits of homework every now and then when i was in school you know admittedly probably not as often as i should have done but you can't just i guess you can't really just sit down and write a story you have to spend the time planning and you were talking about using good notes do you find that having that sort of mixed format be able to do handwritten notes sketch things out and then look at those and then work on a story do you find the ipad really lends itself to that into especially with the apple pencil for those handwritten you know sort of planning notes it's the primary thing that i love about the ipad to be honest the way that it uh, is a uh, it's not really the machine you see when you look at a laptop you you kind of see the laptop and you see the screen floating above and the, your mental context is the the machine whereas with the iPad and with an iPhone to some extent as well your impression of it is just whatever is on the screen at the time because the hardware vanishes i i've always um i've been you know involved with technology and passionate about technology for long enough that having a device like this this thin pretty light portable thing that you can draw on and even touch the screen was always one of those specific tech fetishist dreams and it's such a delight to finally have that and there really really is something about pencil and paper or the mechanisms of interacting as if you're using pencil and paper that just it seems to release something like a a muscle you didn't know you had clenched the whole time when you were sitting using a keyboard and interacting indirectly there is something just subtly psychologically liberating i find when you're just interacting with no barrier between yourself and a pencil in your hand we're also used to it from childhood at least uh, previously it's maybe not going to be true of children for too much longer (laughs) but that that feels like working directly with something it feels more like almost feels more like art itself now than work or thinking or anything that's formal or structured or constrained and i find that i just make so much more progress when i can sit and and draw and scribble and circle things and use a highlighter albeit digitally but the thing that makes that practical of course is that in apps like good notes and increasingly elsewhere in the system uh, it can still read the handwriting and provide search results for text that was handwritten and provide a, a sort of organizational structure whereas if you didn't have that you'd essentially just have the digital equivalent of a whole bunch of sheets of paper and you need to remember where things are and it just be- it sort of becomes a wasted exercise so the ipad for me is actually the perfect either juxtaposition or combination of the liberty of physical creativity, but still having the convenience of digital searchability and organization. It's a, it's a very powerful thing. It really is. And I guess at another practical level, as a writer, you're then not dealing with stacks of paper notes. I mean, you know, I always think back to, you know, seeing those stacks of notes and writers, you know, in, in movies scrunching up the paper, throwing it in the bin. And then you've got things like, you know, in, in black books with not maybe writing, but Bernard turning his, all of his receipts into a fashionable dinner jacket, you know, that mm. dealing with paper 
And I mean, look, we've talked about the environmental impact of tech before on this show, but the fact that for the most part, you're not going to be dealing with with paper unless it. I assume until it, and we'll, we'll talk about what it takes to actually get the stories out there. But until it goes to actual print, I'm going to assume you're not often actually dealing with physical paper anymore. Uh, these days, no, I don't have any uh, encounter with paper until I get in uh, proof copies of of the print versions of books. So it's completely digital. I did, of course, print out the entirety of my first novel back then on paper, ostensibly to proofread it and edit it. But really, it's just because it's, as you say, it's one of these images of being a writer. There's a certain legitimacy to it. And having that big, massive manuscript stacked up in your desk, it's it's a little part of what the dream of being a writer is. But of course, it's also a pain in the arse printing the thing out, and you know if you drop it and have to put it all back in order, and it's it's an artifact rather than anything that's practical. I was going to say, that's assuming the printer works in the first place, because you know printers. Yeah, they're they're temperamental. Although I have to say, since I went to a brother laser printer, I've had absolutely no problem. I've tried to forget the existence of any other type of printer uh, because this thing just works. I'm pretty sure that after nuclear war i could drag it out the cupboard and assuming there was electricity it would just happily print the pages for me without complaint do you know what i at home i i don't have a color printer i just have a black and white brother laser it does uh dual sided it's networked and i've had that thing for over 10 years and apart from occasionally having to change the toner it works it works with everything and uh, you know, okay. I think you and I might have the same printer because I my my uh, brother is a black and white laser with dual side as well. So it's like ML twenty five twenty five W or something, th- something like that. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. it's uh, and they are solid. Like whereas you know, trying to get my parents, for example, have uh, this behemoth of a former workplace HP printer, and it's like trying to navigate the Enterprise out of space dock to get that thing to mm. print. I, I I don't know. I, I, are you a Star Trek fan? Massive. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. I have to say, I haven't taken in too many of the recent uh, series, but um, I mean, I was I was born in 1979, so by the time that Next Generation started in '87, I had had seen Star Trek as in the original series. Mm on the telly back and forth, but I was kind of there and going into high school, 87 to 94, yeah. for Next Generation. So that was very much my Star Trek at the time. Of course, it led straight on to Deep Space Nine and Voyager, which I just devoured as well. So I'm one of these people that up up until that point, say, end of Voyager, good chunk of Enterprise, cer- certainly all the movies through, including Generation First Contact and Insurrection and, and Nemesis, I'd seen absolutely everything. And I've I've had the occasional exposure to the newer stuff as well. The only reason I was asking is when when we were talking about, you know, working with the iPad in terms of writing, an instant mem an instant vision of Jake Sisko in DS9 with all these little pads. And mm. we talked to um, because the episode's been recorded, um we talked to Gideon Mayhew from the Icon Factory about yeah. oh Gideon's such a nice guy um you know got, got to give him a bit of support these days you know after Elon but we were talking about how the, the iPad is very clearly influenced by the pads in Trek and I think we are at a point where okay they're not quite as thin but certainly you could see a Jake Sisko like character sat there you know doing his novels on an iPad yeah, and especially with uh, dictation having come on so much. I mean, the number of times that I tried to record a equivalent of a captain's log using speech recognition back on the original uh, series of Apple Macintosh computers with a Macintosh microphone, and the results were just terrible. Uh, it's getting better, certainly with uh, Siri I tried a, a, a huge number of third-party apps for dictating writing as well, like Max Speech uh, and others whose names I've since forgotten. Dragon back in the day, I which guess. they yeah. yeah, Dragon Dictate, of course. That's the, that was the, the one I was struggling for. Thank you, which provide great results if you train them enough. But the 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 kind of science fiction ideal is that with any accent at all, even my own, 
you can just talk and it just understands you, including the you know the, the appropriate punctuation and I guess even idiomatic words and phrases. And we're just getting so close now. I was just the other day when I was recording a podcast episode, someone had sent me uh, a link to there, there are so many of these startup companies at the moment who are using uh, GPT to auto generate various types of texts that are suitable for different types of endeavor, including podcasts. So in the case of a podcast, it'll take your audio file and it will generate not just a complete transcript, but it will also generate like teaser tweets and, uh, you know, promotional summaries and blog posts and will suggest titles for the episodes and all that sort of thing. And there are four or five of these uh, companies that do this at least. And the, the results are pretty good. And if you, if, if you sort of think about that in terms of the, you know, the Star Trek computer voice recognition, it's, it's not only taking dictation and producing an accurate transcript, but it's also doing creative things with it and understanding quote unquote, uh, some of the context. So we're getting a lot closer to this interesting conversion point where the computers actually do become more like assistants rather than these sort of fairly dumb question and answer machines that they've previously been absolutely no i couldn't agree more and and thank you as a bit, little bit of a tangent but it just came to me when we were, when we were talking about the ipad and i guess ben matt leads us on to because when we talk about um actually you know look you've spent the, the, the months the years getting the book ready getting it to a point where sorry not but the novel i'll use the word novel because book sort of seems to be fair more to i guess more to a printed book doesn't it these days i guess a and is novel the more appropriate term I mean, I I love novel because um, it saves me from answering a second question. Because when you tell people that you're a writer, in my experience, uh, the assumption is journalism at first, which I guess is is fair and reasonable. So I've just got myself into the habit of using the word novelist, not because it's it's a wee bit. It's arty and pretentious, I know. I don't like that side of it, but it just makes it clear uh, right from the front. I guess that books do connote the printed object a bit more, but I see the term uh, interchangeably. I guess everyone's actually so used to ebooks uh, with their Kindles and uh, you know reading Apple books and iOS devices and the Nooks and the various other types of e-reader that are out there that it's the term has become kind of plastic, and now it just refers to uh, a, you know, a published work, regardless of whether it's on paper. That makes a lot of sense. So, and I guess that leads us nicely on to, for, as a writer, how easy is it for you to now, or where did, I guess, so where did you have to start out from to get your stories actually published? I mean, obviously, you're not self-publishing. You, I'm assuming you have a publisher, but what's changed? No, I am actually self published oh, oh, okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, I chose to do that because there's... I mean, there's a there's a lot involved in terms of time and waiting and uncertainty and so on with getting published. And uh, in terms of you can potentially win on the marketing, but that's becoming less and less true. But you lose on the percentages and on the income and on the control. So I am much more of, I like to have control of things. I think this is probably something that is in the DNA of many ex-tech or indeed current tech people, that they like to have visibility into things and like to retain controls and retain options. And uh, the publishing landscape is such that it's, it's, it's it can be a lottery win to find a publisher, indeed to find representation before that in order to get to a publisher. And with royalty rates, etc., um, it's often better these days with everything being so available to you on the internet, distribution, marketing, all of it, uh, if you're capable of doing it yourself and you've got the the energy and the time to do it yourself, it's a much faster route to market. I hate to use such a term, but there it is. Uh, and it just gives you a lot more control over your own creative product and you're not signing rights away to anyone via a third party. Um, but publishing these days is... I guess the word would be democratized, wouldn't it? Um, the, e the ebook stuff is dead easy. You already have your ebook uh, from your writing app. You know, Ulysses, Scrivener, uh, Vellum, a whole bunch of other apps on any platform can generate 
uh, beautifully formatted and perfectly valid, ready to go ebook uh, cover arts and other thing. You need to pay for that from someone if you don't want to do it yourself. I'm not a designer, so and people do very much judge a book by its cover, especially in the ebook thing. You know, ebook. Uh, stores online and amazon websites and all that sort of thing we're just scrolling past loads of little thumbnails you need to grab people so i prefer to just uh you know pay for a competent designer i use stuart batch at, at books covered he's fantastic but once you've got that you've got your ebook you're ready to upload it's just a matter of filling in a lot of metadata setting prices taking the various boxes for distribution etc and away you go when you've done it before and you're used to it, you can go from not having uh, a book up anywhere. As long as you've got the actual ebook file ready and the cover ready, you can be out there and available to buy on the various Amazon stores around the world, the various Apple stores around the world, etc. Within 48 hours, quite readily. Wow! Paper is a, a slightly different thing because you there are more stringent requirements for the print master. A PDF file. Uh, there's there's a lot that goes into crop boxes, and you know the pages obviously are running uh, left and right, and there's a, a lot of typographical convention and so on uh, needed for that. But again, the writing apps take care of quite a lot of it for you. The cover art obviously has different requirements. Typically, they're using a CMYK print process instead of an RGB uh, file, so colors are going to render differently because of different gamuts. I don't know how uh, savvy your listeners might be on that stuff, but it's you know it's like anything else in tech. You just if you want to do it yourself, you just read up about it, learn about it. It's nothing as rocket science if you want to spend some time and some neurons on it. <laughs> you get that stuff ready, and you. There's an approval process for print because you you need to actually get a physical copy of it printed so you can see that it's rendering yeah. properly. Things aren't being chopped out. The color hasn't run or things haven't disappeared because there's not as much contrast between foreground and background as you think, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's more uh, lead time involved with that and more cost because you're always paying for books to be printed and bound and sent to you. Uh, but the the main th- thing that you need there is uh, distribution. And even if it's print on demand, which is the the model these days whereby a customer places an order and then a book is printed in response to that and shipped out to them. So it's a just in time kind of thing. Even with that, you obviously need your book's data to be available. So it needs to be pushed into the Amazon catalog, pushed into the Apple catalog, ideally pushed into all of the booksellers. So I guess Barnes & Noble, etc. in the United States, Waterstones, etc. here in the UK, uh, the independent bookstores, public libraries as well, uh, who can order books uh, for you. Uh, hopefully, uh, your listeners know that. If there's a you know a book you want, you can go to your library, you can order it. It's wonderful for you because you get a book for free. It's great for your library because they get used and uh, they're engaged and they get new books. And it's actually great for authors as well because we get a better royalty when copies go to libraries than via bookstores, believe it or not, um, even though it's even though it's more affordable for the library as well. So, yeah, there's, there's a fair bit involved and there's a lot of moving parts, but it's like anything else. The first time is the worst time. And after that, you just get a wee routine and a wee checklist going and each new launch gets faster and faster in terms of the, the technicalities and the administrative side. And you can focus more on the promotion and the marketing and the social media and so on. And I, I mean, the one question, so with that print on demand model, does that mean that effectively, if I were to take a trip into the town centre and go into Waterstones, am I going to randomly find Matt Gemmel books on my shelf? Uh, on average, no, but sometimes, uh, sometimes. What you certainly will uh, find is if you go in and go to the counter and say, can you get me, it'll be on the computer. Right. Because the industry standard data feeds are there and they can obtain it quickly. Is that all based on the, is it the ISBN system? Yeah, um, print, printed materials all require uh, an ISBN, and it's got to be a unique ISBN for each different edition, even of the same work. So if you get a paperback, you get a hardback, you get an ebook, that's going to be three ISBNs. Although in, in practice, ebooks, some of the 
the ebook sellers don't require an ISBN, but certainly for the printed versions, that's the the kind of master code. And ISBNs also must be purchased um, because there's only certain companies in each country, different one for the UK, for France, for the United States, and so on and so on that can sell these ISBNs. So it costs, and they cost a fair bit of money. They're expensive, but it is a, a necessary cost of doing business if you're going to produce printed materials. And of course, there is also the deposit libraries aspect of things where by law in each country, and you need to check with your own country, you might be required to lodge a copy of every uh, printed publication you produce with them so that they've got, you know, got it on record. So the uh, British Library, I think the, the Bodleian uh, in Oxford, I think uh, Tr- Trinity, uh, the Dublin campus has got one of these. Um, uh, National Library of Scotland, I think, as well. But you can you can find these things online, and you send them a copy, and the you know three years later send you a lovely headed note paper letter saying you know thanks, we got it. We'll put it in a vault underground somewhere forever. <laughs> Yeah, because a, f- a friend of mine, uh, I've got a friend, a good friend of mine who's actually studying at Oxford. He's uh, doing um, his uh, PhD in comp sci. And another friend of ours is a massive book nerd and keeps trying to get this other friend to let him into the Baudelaire Library with his student ID. And my friend's like, no, I can't let you in. They would kill, they, you know, oh. it's, it's really tightly controlled apparently. But And that, that's a really good uh, point, by the way. Do support your local library if you love to read. You know, unfortunately, independent bookshops and, you know, and as much as Amazon and Barnes & Noble Online are wonderful places to get things in, certainly from a digital book point of view, your independent booksellers... Go and support them. I, I think is that. A f- I mean, I don't. You might disagree as as a pub, as an author, but I, I doubt you will. But I, I'm I'm, may, I'm putting myself in a difficult situation here. But like, support independent booksellers and and your local libraries. As as Matt said, he gets more money if you order a book through through the library. That's always a good thing, and it means that the libraries stay open because they're far more than just a collection of books. Gosh, yes. Um, you're, you're finding people who are passionate about. Um providing information and entertainment to people and there's something at least still for you and I there's a a certain coziness and a certain nostalgia and a certain comfort to not just libraries but the very similar atmosphere in independent bookshops there's the the closeness of the shelves the smell of the paper uh, that's more on the bookshop side and there's that sort of that wonderful reassuring sort of institutional quality <laughs> to public libraries uh, there's also no, there's nothing like as as a as an author there's nothing quite like seeing your book in a local library in your own city your own town you know there's there's something just there's a, there's a wee element of that, uh, I have made it, I have got a little piece of the dream that I was hoping for. Also, on a practical matter, for goodness sake, uh, help yourself, help your library and help your bookshop by putting your genre on the back cover of your books. Don't make them guess or read the blurb or whatever, because you can get some interesting mistakes made. Tell them where it should be shelved and librarians will thank you. Yes, help the poor librarians. Um, they they do a great. I mean, I couldn't do that. I could not organise books like that. I mean, my own bookshelves at home are well bookshelf. So I, I yeah, I love local libraries. I haven't done it. I haven't been to mine for a while. But that's not through not wanting to. It's just well, I live in Boscombe. Boscombe Library. Hmm. We'll we'll, we'll leave it at that, folks. Anyway, so. <laughs> Let's move on a little bit to another very important tool because uh, of writing, and that has to be you know if you're not using the pen to do your notes, mo- you're going to be using the keyboard. Now I know you from what, sort of talking to you on, and obviously seeing some of your your um, your I was going to say tweets, but toots. Now I know you have a bit of a thing for a mechanical keyboard. What what is it that is so important about getting that good keyboard? What why why can you not use like the five pound Poundland keyboard. Well, I, I think that's one of these questions that one's spouse perhaps asks one uh, when the latest mechanical keyboard arrives. I mean, of course you could, and we all go through life using, uh, you know, whatever random keyboard is included with the computer you're compelled to use at the time. You, you know, you've you've 
you've got to choose your drugs basically don't you you know you, there are some things that you want to just spend money on and dive deep into and feel that you're an enthusiast about something and this one it's it's got so much to offer me because one it's tech it's related to computers it's electronics it's to do with writing and it has this wonderful this this physicality this tactility this percussiveness and endless tweaking and it overlaps massively with electronics and soldering uh, or soldering for your american listeners of course um and wires and gadgets and gizmos and multimeters and all that stuff but also uh, there's a there's an artistic element to it you know with, with customizing the keycaps and the rgb underlighting and all that nonsense so it's it's one of these things that you can uh, go far down the rabbit hole i suppose you would say and i've got a i, w- I wouldn't even like to say in case my wife does listen uh, to this episode just how many of them i've got but i've got a few different mechanical keyboards in the cupboard and i do genuinely rotate through them uh, every every few weeks or so because you know hey if nothing else it's yet another way to procrastinate indeed indeed i mean look i'm i'm, I'm using now look i'm not sure if this qualifies i'm i i'm using one of those gaming mechanical keyboards it is a logitech it's what is it it's a tk413 i think and it has that percussive it has that nice feel but i know that i eventually want to upgrade i've I don't understand anything about. I'll be honest. I don't. I don't really understand the difference between the switches because, from a from a trying to keep it as as simple as we can, what's the difference between, say, for example, then help her? Maybe we talk about mechanical, but what makes a keyboard mechanical? What's the difference between, say, let's take for example, Apple's um, what if we call it Magic Keyboard these days? The Magic Keyboard, what? Yeah. What makes a mechanical keyboard so substantially different in in feel and bait, well mechanics, I guess, to that sort of keyboard? Yeah, well, the, the 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 commonly kind of accepted definition, I think, with a mechanical keyboard is that it's it's simple. It's just that the entirety of the switch mechanism for each key is a separate little unit. That's on the technical side. If you've got your Apple. Uh, what you call it, Magic Keyboard or the keyboard that plugs into the iPads or whatever, which I guess is also called a Magic Keyboard. Is, yeah, yeah. Um, then you've got each key's obviously got a separate uh, a keycap thing on the top and it's got some sort of uh, hinge or scissor mechanism or whatever underneath. But beneath that, there's just one big board with all the actual contact sensors and electronics it's an, and it's all one big bit. Whereas on a mechanical keyboard, what you'll find is if you pop off the key cap that's got the letter or the number on it or whatever, and you see the little bit that is going up and down, that's a separate component. So the post that sticks up the top that key cap connects to, the sort of receiver that it goes into, the spring, whatever else might be in it, and the electronics to make the connection, it's a separate little unit and you can the big attraction uh, with most mechanical keyboards is that you can pop out those switches the thing that you know actually provides the contact when you press the keycap down for different ones that have different feels and they broadly fall into three categories there's the linear type which is common in gaming keyboards because you can easily press them super fast which can be an advantage in games that just basically goes straight up and down it's like pressing a spring you know it's nice and smooth straight up and down no particular bump in the middle no noise it's just literally pressing down on a, a spring or a sponge or something like that and it's called linear uh, advantages as i say they're fast and they're very quiet generally speaking the second category is tactile and they they have a noticeable sort of bump either halfway down or a quarter of the way down or two thirds of the way down or whatever you will feel just this mechanism engaging but without much of an appreciable noise and typists kind of like that because you're getting feedback all the time physical feedback through your fingertips you know exactly when you've pressed the keys you can get a nice rhythm going a flow and the third category which is really just a a close cousin of the tactile type is clicky uh, and as the name implies 
it doesn't just have that tactile bump. It also makes a, a noise, a snicky, 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 snicky noise much closer to the typewriters of old. Not the kind of thing you would probably want to use if you're in the office uh, or, you know, you've got a sleeping child right through a thin wall or something like that. But there are loads of variants of these varying, not just the broad type, but how there are different categories switch in terms of how tall they are, how far your fingers have to go, how much force is required to actuate them. Etc. 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 Et Just like any hobby, particularly ones on the technical side, you can pretty much go as deep as you want to go. I think it's just about customization. You know, we do the same things to our computers with stickers on the back. We do the same things to our cars. We redecorate our home offices. It's it's just it's another one of those things. You you decide to spend the time and the energy on getting something that you feel is personal to you and reflects effort and the sort of an aesthetic and all these sort of things and i think i think it just um it's like any other hobby in that regard absolutely and i you know i know from speaking to and seeing you know people doing keyboard streams i think is it uh, is it stephen hackett who does a keyboard building stream every now and then from yeah yeah Seeing the passion people pointing to build, look, I I've never built a mechanical keyboard, and I probably never will. I I don't know, maybe, well, maybe, but I know they can get. Let, again, if Mrs. Gemmell's listening, you just close your ears for this bit. They can get very expensive. Oh yeah, wildly expensive. Um, the thing with the, the the thing that surprises a lot of people when they find out about the whole mechanical keyboards hobby is that typically you're not buying things in the way that you're used to buying things. Uh, when you want to buy something like uh, like almost anything, um, you go online, you place an order, and it arrives in a, in a few days. But it's, it's not like that with mechanical keyboards. Uh, mechanical keyboards are pretty much all of the purchasing is based on these things called group buys, which you might have encountered, whereby a certain number of people have to sign up and commit to buying the thing before the orders are even placed. So it's kind of like Kickstarter, um, but it's it's pretty much always like that. And the lead times are months, if not years away. And that is absolutely the normal, everyday, most common scenario by far. And that's not just for entire keyboards. That's also routinely for sets of key caps just the you know the actual printed key surfaces that plug on uh, there are loads of different sets different as you can imagine typefaces and materials and uh, and colors etc etc that are manufactured all the time but you almost always have to wait a year two years or whatever for them to arrive and they're massively expensive. You can readily, for a complete set of nice quality keycaps with all of the extras that will suit any size of keyboard you might put them on in the future, be spending hundreds of US dollars, pounds, euros, and waiting months or years to get them. So it's at, at its deeper levels, it's a, it's a bit of a nutter's kind of hobby, to be honest. But... You know, equally, you're getting something that is uh, relatively unique and you won't find it probably on anyone else's desk and there's a sense of ownership and investment and so on and so forth. And of course, there's a little economy built into it with resale of and how much keycaps hold their value and all the madness of it, if you want to go that far. Personally, I just like having a typing machine that I've customized to the feel that I like, that makes me feel like a writer and that feels like it's mine in the same way that, you know, you, you know, you buy a nice car that you've wanted or you get a nice desk chair or something like that. Mm. And, and that's, that can, is it not uh, maybe a good question? Cause I'm, you know, obviously you can buy pre-made you, mechanical keyboards, you know, this, this Logitech, I guess, is it fair to say you kind of have to watch out for, maybe things that aren't quite as well built in the lower price. I mean, when we talk for a good mechanical keyboard, what would you say is a, a, a at this point, you know you're probably getting something decent price point? You know, it, it varies enormously. As with so many things, if you're willing to build yourself, then you can get the individual components pretty cheaply. Uh, the the major cost of a mechanical keyboard is not the the PCB the printed circuit board thing in the middle of it not at all, 
And each of the individual key switches, even though you need dozens and dozens of them, the the actual unit price is very cheap. You can get, you know, a hundred odd key switches for I don't know, twenty, thirty, forty quid, whatever it is. Uh, the keycap sets tend to be expensive, and all of the other stuff that goes in. Actually, when you're buying a nice mechanical keyboard, very often the biggest cost by far is the casing of it, the physical casing, because they're very often made of nice uh, pieces of aluminium and it's made out of a single bit and it's all nicely polished or whatever. And then there's a metal plate inside that's got all the holes in it for where the key switches go in because you don't usually plug key switches directly into the circuit board beneath. Often they go through a metal or polycarbonate plate or something. So a lot of wee bits and there's the feet and there's maybe foam inside to dampen sound and cushion components, blah, 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 blah. So because um, of all of that, it's pretty common to buy kits, which gives you an entire keyboard, albeit you have to assemble it yourself when it arrives, and that's the hundreds of pounds. If you're just lo- looking to get started with a nice uh, sort of tactile mechanical keyboard, I I think you could readily get something really nice and, and usable from the slightly more budgety brands and, pro- and still be under 100 quid uh, today. So there's Ducky, um, like Ducky, Ducky, like the animal, is a, a brand. And if you're looking to go up slightly into a brand that's really popular in the, the Mac or Apple world and has a huge variation on offer, there's a company called Keychron, so K-E-Y-C-H-R-O-N. Uh, Logitech's very well thought of as well. I think they've got a, a bunch of mechanical offerings as well as, of course, they're more Apple-style membrane all in one portable bluetoothy keyboards and there's, there's just lots you can do I'm, I'm not someone who says you know it's not worth it if you're not spending more than x hundred pounds god no um if you want to try a mechanical keyboard start by getting something at 30 or 40 quid off of amazon and see if you like the feel and the noise the main at- attraction of it is that you can probably replace the bits of it you don't like so much without throwing the whole thing away because it's decomposable you know oh that makes sense because look i i'm that you've already kind of answered one of the questions i was gonna ask you i one of the problems when you look at not problems when you look at pre-made keyboards most of them tend to be very pc focused so they'll have the pc keyboard layout Mm. but keychron do seem to do some very nice mac layouts and I will admit, I am probably looking at one of it. It's about just under £100. We'll put a link in the show notes, and it's the one... I haven't decided if I want to go 10 keyless or not. I mean, for, for hmm, it, it's a tricky one. I mean, this this whole week I'll be using this Logitech without a numpad, so we'll see how that goes for work, because I have to enter a few numbers at work. But they look really nice, and they have swappable keycaps so that you can use them on PC or on Mac. And I think out of the box, they come ready for Mac. And yeah, I mean, they, they sounds like they're a good choice, Ben Keychrons. I think I've forgotten which one it is off the top of my head, but it's a, just under a They've got a big range. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the, the nice thing with mechanical keyboards is that once you get out of the very uh, entry level range, virtually all of them have customizable firmware. So you can remap all the keys anyway, you know. Um, so getting a. PC looking keyboards uh, to be suitable for macOS or iOS is a matter of uh, you know popping off a couple of keys so you can replace um, you know the Windows key with a, a command key if you like that and switching the the sort of assigned function of that key yes using software which then sort of sends it down onto your keyboard and records it on the keyboard, and then from then on, it, it just does that. And that's all that your keychrons are doing when you flip the switch on the side to go from PC to Mac. They're just um, choosing a new key map, basically, and virtually every mechanical keyboard lets you do that, and indeed much more comprehensively. You can extensively change what all the keys do, and since you can swap the keycaps around, you can you know literally move your keycaps around to suit your new configuration. On the subject of the numpad there, I've never been able to use the number row across the top of the keyboard very accurately without looking at it. I mean, I'm a 10-finger touch typist, I think, very rapidly, but I always make mistakes with number row because from keyboard to keyboard, it tends to drift around a bit, and it's just it's just a bit arbitrary, whereas I'm so used to that numpad layout or a desk calculator that 
on many of my mechanical keyboards, almost none of which have a physical numpad, I can just press a combination of keys to toggle it into a mode whereby there is a numpad laid out across the keys in that same seven, eight, nine, four, five, six, one, two, three, zero layout so I can use it the way my muscle memory expects but without needing to have a physical separate set of keys and that's the one of the the big benefits of mechanical keyboards in that you can have as many layers of functionality as you like oh so you can use like like I mean like a function key or a key combination to go into the next layer exactly like um the same way as caps lock key suddenly turns all the the alphabetical keys into uppercase versions of themselves or the same way that holding the shift key turns the numbers into exclamation and at symbol and so on you can do that as much as you like and for anything so the keyboard i've got in front of me my, myself right now um which is a plank it's um ortholinear so it's uh, completely a grid it's not the rows aren't staggered at all and it's just four rows of 12 keys so no room for function keys or number keys or a numpad or separate cursor block or page up page down or anything but i've got all of those functions in that keyboard via combinations i've got a numpad i've got a mouse in there cursor keys lighting control i've also got a number row i've got a whole bunch of extra symbols on dedicated keys that i don't even have on a full-size regular keyboard because i've customized it so if you're the kind of person who and this is common in tech that likes to customize their their setup and their wallpaper and their shell scripts and you know tweak their app themes and color schemes and all that sort of thing you're a tweaker and a customizer and a personalizer which i think is very very common in tech people then mechanical keyboards could be quite dangerously attractive to you (laughs) for that reason i I should probably ask it this time how how many hours have you wasted no wait no let me rephrase that how many hours have you spent fiddling with a mechanical keyboard when maybe you should have been working on a chapter of a book the, the novel uh, I would have to say all of the hours that I've spent <laughs> fiddling with mechanical keywords. Uh, and the, the, the verb would definitely be wasted rather than spent. But I guess it depends, depends how you assign value to time. You know, if you get enjoyment out of not just the outcome, but the, the process and the feeling of empowerment and the fact that you're exercising your mind i guess in order to optimize something for yourself and i'm someone who very much does derive enjoyment from that then it can't be time wasted really can it no not at all matt speaking of time i'm very conscious that we both probably have things to do today but this has been such a great discussion one thing i wanted to sort of ask you before we wrapped up is if one of our listeners is maybe consider i want to start writing full time i want to start actually telling stories or you know writing a a book what would you say as a someone who's been through this and and spent what the last 10 years doing this what would be your biggest piece of advice for them well uh, my first uh, the first thing i would say would be encouragement it's uh, never been so accessible as it is today there are no barriers as long as you're online you can readily get software to help you you can readily get the advice you can readily publish not just digitally but in print and you can absolutely do it all Uh, There are a huge number of extremely helpful guides, books, uh, websites, podcasts, all of that sort of thing. The main advice, though, that I would give you is uh, the only thing that can truly get in your way and stop you writing is yourself. So set aside some time, put aside the hesitation the embarrassment sit down and just commit to writing something no matter how silly uh, the beautiful thing about writing is that the more you write the more inspired you get the easier it gets and there's always editing to fix it later i was hugely passionate about writing as a teenager and then i put it aside for more sensible and financially responsible things did university comp side degree worked and so on and so forth but the love of that form of creativity with written word never went away and when i came back to it, it was like it wasn't just like coming home it was like getting younger again if you have the urge to do it 
then you have the capability to do it because speaking as a father of a two and a half year old uh, son, creativity is an absolutely natural built in pre-existing human faculty. It's not something you need to worry about or worry about not having. Everyone has got any number of stories to tell. So sit down and get started. Awesome. I love that advice. And Matt, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a genuine pleasure. Where can people find more about you? Uh, and obviously make sure they, uh, and also the books, where, where can people find everything? I am online at mattgemmel.scott. That's M-A-T-T-G-E-M-M-E-L-L dot Scott, S-C-O-T, of course. And you can find all of my books there, my podcast, my blog, and jumping off points to my social media accounts everywhere. I'd absolutely love to hear from you. Fantastic. And folks, please do yeah, tell, let us know, you know, do you have any stories about, you know, writing or do you have um, your like, oh my gosh, I spent four, four years building a mechanical keyboard. Um, drop those over to podcast at crosswise.net or come and join me discord. Come and we'll, you know, we'll be putting this up as a discussion thread. Uh, come and join us. Uh, just listen to the outro for the links. Matt, thank you again for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, James. The pleasure has assuredly been mine. Let's roll that outro. Thanks for listening to this episode of Cross Wires. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion and we'd love to hear your thoughts. So please drop us a note over to podcast at crosswires.net. You can also drop us a comment on the post or if you're a good pod user, why not start a discussion there too? You can also join our new Discord server at crosswires.net forward slash Discord. We've got forum channels for each episode and we'd love you to join the discussion there. You can also follow us on Mastodon at crosswires at mastodon.social. And of course, you can find the show in all the good podcast apps and all the really bad ones too. More of our content, head on over to crosswires.net slash YouTube for all our videos and keep an eye on our Twitch channel at crosswires.net slash live our upcoming streams if you like what we heard please do drop a review in your podcast directory of choice it really does help spread the word about the show and of course if you can spare even the smallest amount of financial support we'd be incredibly grateful you can support us at ko-fi.com slash crossed wires that is ko-fi.com slash crossed wires until next time thanks for listening